Zanhu Zoom, good afternoon everyone and welcome. We are at the Morris Thompson Cultural and Visitor Center. I'm your host today, Dewey Kothlia Hoffman. We're going to be carrying out a presentation produced by Danak Naga, which is a nonprofit that serves as the voice for Alaska Native elders throughout the interior. Danak Naga collaborates with the Morris Thompson Center and Tana Chiefs Conference to bring you this series called Our People Speak with generous support from Doyan Limited. The series features elders and culture bearers discussing seasonal Alaska Native cultural topics. Today, we wanna to welcome our esteemed guests, Daryl Hildebrand and Deborah Lynn. We're gonna be talking about migratory birds and springtime in Alaska. And welcome to our guests. Thank you for joining us. Before we start, just a quick few announcements. First, this episode is being recorded and will be released April 14th at noon on Morris Thompson Center website, Facebook, and YouTube. You can revisit this program anytime you like on those platforms, watch our past programs, or other series we've produced. Also, at the end of our program, there's a table just outside the theater doors here where you can sign up for our email list or if you'd like to be notified of our upcoming programs. There's also comment cards, and we really appreciate your feedback. There are links to donate to support programs like these on the Morris Thompson Center and Danakanaga website. And those are all of our announcements. So thank you for joining us today. So we'll start with introductions uh, over here. Would you like to share a little bit about yourself and what brings you to our, our show today? Um, I'm Deborah Lynn. I work with Tanana Chiefs Conference. I help with the, um, I, I work with as a climate change coordinator and within that framework I include helping out with the Migratory Bird Co-Management Council and Tanana Chiefs has the interior uh, regional representatives for um, this management, uh, it's a co-management between the state, tribal, and federal government. And so uh, twice a year they meet and they discuss migratory birds and I'm involved with those meetings. So I find it very fascinating to be able to um, participate in listening to tribal members and state and federal um, talk about the migratory birds that come into Alaska. That's it. Daryl, go ahead. And my name is Daryl Hildebrand. I'm the uh, public safety manager for Tanana Chiefs Conference. And my background is uh, I worked for almost uh, 21 years as an Alaska wildlife trooper. Um, prior to that, I was a resource user growing up in the village of Nalato. Um, my experience in migratory birds come from um, just my interaction with my grandparents and going out uh, spring bird hunting. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'll bring to the discussion today. Okay, that's it. Thank you both. So, Daryl, maybe you can kick us off. Can you share a little bit about what you first started learning about migratory birds? Oh gosh, it was before I can even remember. Mm -hmm. um, from the time I was real small, uh, I remember being in the boat with my grandfather, uh, Ed Hildebrand, uh, out spring bird hunting right after the ice would move. Uh, we would go out. Um, looking for ducks. Uh, so that's my first introduction into um, migratory birds. So that was, shoot, I'm not gonna give you my age, but that was a long time ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> exciting time of year, huh? After it was very exciting. Hunkered uh, down for the winter and then the river opens up and yep. everything is It's shifting. always a sense of renewal every spring when you get to go back out and start enjoying uh, water activities, you know, mm -hmm. being in the boat, uh, going to camps and uh, springing out for a couple of weeks with them while you're harvesting mm -hmm. and gathering. So it's always a special time of the year. I remember when I started uh, going to elementary school and uh, May came around, uh, boy, it was tough being in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't wait till the ice was gone from the river and uh, our grandparents would come and take us. Uh, last week of school, we typically didn't do anything anyways out in the village, but um, cleaned and you know did uh, picnics and that type of stuff. So as um, soon as that last week of school came around, they would take us over to Caillou to do our spring gathering. 
So it was always a special time for me. Couldn't mm -hmm. wait for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And how about you, Deborah? Um, I've always been fascinated by birds because I've always thought that, you know, when you see the migration of birds going to another area, you're, I'm just amazed that they could fly so high in the sky and how they could just be able to travel long distances. And I'm fascinated. Um, some of the birds that come into Alaska that have traveled far distances, like the Arctic Tern, it goes all the way to south of, uh, to Antarctica and back up. So it's traveling 24,000 miles in a round trip that I think, you know, I just came in from Bend, Oregon, and, you know, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, jet, I'm bird, you know, I just flew in, I should say, <laughs> from, <laughs> I didn't have to fly. I didn't have to get out there. And, and, you know, this Arctic turn is only 20 inches. And being able to take that route is, to me, is just phenomenal what uh, the endurance of what these birds do and the exotic places they get to travel. And hence the word uh, snowbird comes in for a good reason. I mean, I think they're pretty smart. They know, let's go find somewhere nice for the winter and come back to Alaska when it's really beautiful and full of uh, nutrients. And so that's my fascination is what these birds are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. I notice you have a list there. Can you talk about some of the migratory birds that we have here in Alaska? Okay, just to kind of give a background of what this list is that I'm holding here. Uh, I work with uh, Danaka Naka, the elders, um, putting together the names of all of the migratory birds that come into Alaska. And so there's a list here of those birds, and there, um, there's uh, two pages. This one has um, stories of the elders about the different birds, and some of these are songbirds and uh, local stories. And then on the other side was, the, here's the migratory birds, sorry I had that wrong. And there's several different dialects for Athabascan within the interior of Alaska, and we only started off with four. Um, and so it has all the different names for the di that they use for the different uh, migratory birds. And there's several of them that are really important to the interior for subsistence hunting is um, like the um, white fronted geese is the, the largest um, uh, bird that the, is harvested in this area, along with mallards and different ducks and and um, the Canadian geese, of course, is the, the popular one we're always seeing here in this area. But there's quite a few lists there mm -hmm. of, of migratory birds that fly in and out of Alaska. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, specific birds that you have a connection to or any experiences throughout your lifetime that maybe you'd want to share at this time? You know, we see it as a food source after a long winter mm -hmm. when the migratory birds started to come in. And especially the uh, Canadian goose, you know, there's a lot of meat on a Canadian goose. Um, even the lesser Canadian goose has a lot of meat on it. The white or snow goose has mm -hmm. a lot of meat. And then the emperor geese, um, were, that were, the emperor geese always seemed like they were a lot fatter and healthier than the other geese for some reason. I don't know why uh, that was. but. Um, those were a favorite of just about everybody at home. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a fascination with uh, seagulls, their, their wing shape and design. Um, and this comes from my background in aviation and the fact that the uh, Wright brothers um, basically camped out on the beach in uh, Kitty Hawk and just studied how the eagles flew and how are the eagles to seagulls flew and how they used their wings to turn and how mm -hmm. they would do, use wing warping and um, it was real fascinating uh, study that they did and then they eventually uh, invented the aircraft which um, flying was has been a passion of mine my whole life yeah you're a trained licensed aviator right yes i am yeah i flew for the uh, state troopers my whole career mm -hmm. and for some years prior to that um, my first one of my first memories was of being in 
in an airplane mm -hmm. with my uh, biological dad. Mm -hmm. And then I flew later with my uh, stepdad. When I was 11 and 12 years old, he would let us fly the airplane. Nice. That's something I hope to pursue in my future at some point. Yep, so, yeah. The seagull, even you can't eat it. <laughs> what, do you have a favorite tasting bird? Uh, Gitzetl. What's that one? Teal. A teal? A little small, little fat butterball teal. Oh. Yeah. It's nice. tender and fat, and it's just a, seems like it's a juicier bird. It's not as dry as the other birds. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, uh, my only experience birding would be on the roads, like um, going after grouse, like um, lots of roads out of Ruby where I come from, mining roads and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And they're, mm, they're not very skittish, so I remember... This isn't always a perfect shot for the go, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like they let you get them sometimes. But yeah, yes. I remember seeing lots of uh, spruce grouse and sometimes ptarmigan running across the roads there. Just to note that they're not a migratory bird. Oh, okay. They're not listed as a migratory bird, but they're a, a large population for Because they hunting. stay here year-round? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think we have seven species of grouse in Alaska, I think. Oh, okay. I can't name them all, but I can come close. Yeah. Just checking. Um, um, yeah, there's several of them. And, and then the ptarmigan is in that family, mm -hmm. and it's our state bird. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So if they're not migratory, what's the term for that? Just live here around? Resident. Resident. <laughs> 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 so they get their PFDs? <laughs> if they file on time? They qualify. They just don't file. Right? <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. I remember, too, just um, going out in a wall tent, and you notice over time how the songbirds, as they come in, just that chorus gets louder and louder, of course, through a wall tent, you know, you, you can hear everything almost. So that's one of the memories I have growing up. Right. I love camping out. And spring when we go out and um, with the boats uh, and we set up our camps, it was typically in wall tents. And, and you're right, early in the morning, about 4 o'clock, you start hearing the songbirds start their day. Mm. Uh, typically the robins would start out first and then the rest of the songbirds would join in and Mm -hmm. uh, before you get up for breakfast, you'd have a chorus of songbirds going out, mm -hmm. on out there. Um, really special memories growing up and waking up to that mm -hmm. with my grandpa frying bacon and uh, cooking mm -hmm. uh, eggs on the on the cook stove, on the camp stove. Yeah, draws nice. you right out of the tent. Uh huh. You mentioned your grandpa. Is there anything that? he might have shared with you that you want to emphasize with this topic today? So as far as harvesting um, waterfowl in the springtime, you only harvest what you need mm. and try not to harvest the females. Okay. If you can. The egg layers. Yep. If you can leave the females, uh, leave the females. So, so you got to know how to identify the different types. Yes. Would that be through like the coloring or? Through the coloring, um, they taught us, he taught us the difference between males and females at an early age. Um, it's a little bit more difficult when you're hunting the geese to determine which one is male or female, but like all the other um, waterfowl species, are, are, it gets easier. Mm -hmm. um, snow geese is another hard one to identify, but uh, when they get closer, or if you're up close enough to them, you can identify them. Um, there's just a little distinctions like around their beaks and feet and stuff that you can oh, you okay. have to really look at them um, the uh, ducks on the other hand are very easy to identify um, just because of their colorations mm -hmm. the brighter birds are uh, easy to identify mm -hmm. so. mallards and yeah mallards especially in I mean this one's green and one's brown you don't want to shoot the brown ones oh okay <laughs> so it's easy to tell yeah so easy. aside from yummy soup, what are some of the uses that 
your family has found or, or in our native community has been using these animals for? Well, there's a lot of different uses you can, you can uh, make them. Besides just eating all of the, most of the bird, you can utilize the furs, uh, the feathers for um, bedding. You can utilize the feathers for pillows, uh, mm -hmm. quilts, um, parkas, uh, the down feathers for parkas. Um, headgear for uh, traditional song and dance. Um, uh, head uh, you use feathers for fans. I mean, there's there's so many different uses for feathers. Um, I don't remember them using the skin for anything in particular, but um, they used the bag or the um, food bag for children for, as rattles. They tang them up, or blow them up, tie oh, yeah. them off, hang them up, and dry them and they rattle, so. Um, See those hanging up in people's houses sometimes? Mm -hmm. So there's. I think there's it's called bebet in Danaka. Uh huh. And the uh, leg bones, you could use those for straws. Uh, a lot of people use them for, or there's a certain bone in the bird that they use for um, uh, head headgear. When they beat headgear, and they, they use the bone as the holding piece, so. Oh, okay. You know, how, tie it on it there. It goes through. Mm -hmm. So, I've seen that. Uh, I'm sure there's more uses that I'm just not aware of. Mm -hmm. And is there anything from this project or that you've come across? Any particular examples from elders about the types of birds or some of their uses that you'd like to share? Well, there's several um, stories that they talked about as far as a relationship mm -hmm. for like the long tail uh, duck would come it when it comes in in the in around June the long tail duck will come on the river and it will be a, if there's a lot of them coming in then it means there's going to be a lot of salmon coming and if there's not any coming along the river and they'll do a fly down and go five miles and turn around and come back and there'll be a huge flock of them then you know that there's going to be salmon, and what is happening is there's hardly any of these long-tailed ducks returning back to the oh. river. So it's a, that's a, you know an indicator bird, and then there's another natural indicator bird is the olive-sided Fletcher, fly Fletcher that it's called the messenger bird, and it actually has a sound that says it's says three days, three days. I guess it's the sound of it. I haven't heard this, but this is the story that I was told. And so that it means that when it sings the song three days in the um, in their language or in their mm -hmm. song, then then the salmon comes in three days. And so there's some of those type of stories. And then the last story is they spoke about um, the elders told a story Several elders have told me the story about the robin, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you could add to Dr. that story, mm -hmm. and um, how they're not singing their same song anymore, and it's not as long, and that because the native language is not being spoke all the time, then the robins are not speaking their language either mm. all the time. I don't know if you want to expound on that story, but that was I, several I, elders <laughs> have told that story. I know the story, but I I couldn't I couldn't pronounce how the song goes. But it, then they ended satni hatni hatni. So todo salen kukoi tiga tilzu tilzu setni setni hehe. We use hatni hatni at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. And just for our viewers or our people who are learning about this region, we're talking about the blue interior Athabascan, probably from, would it be between the villages of Fort Yukon downriver, or, or what geographic area are we, are we referring to with the, the data you've collected? It does, it has a Gwich'in language, oh, so okay. it goes so up, it into go up into, stand into mm -hmm. Old mm -hmm. Crow area, mm -hmm. so it reaches It'll cover up. everything just about, yeah. Okay, the blue the blue section for our except below Koi Cook. There's no Nalado and Caltech. They didn't put that dialect on there. Oh, okay. On this map. Oh, okay. Yeah, doesn't cover. We have our own distinct dialect communities. Yeah, Daryl mentioned that he didn't see his dialect on this map, even though we have Koi Cook 
uh, language on here, some of the dialect, but it, once again, the dialect, there's several different, mm -hmm. um, but that's the stories that basically are the elders that I, we had utilized. Mm -hmm. from. Yeah, and one single animal might have five or six names, seems like, even like nicknames. <laughs> moose, <coughs> moose is a perfect example of that. Did you say moose? No. Oh. Yeah, moose is a perfect example of different ways of pronouncing mm. it in the native. Like mm -hmm. in, at home, we call it Diniga. Some people call it Diniji. Oh, okay. And so, and, and then as you go further up the river, it, it changes even more. Oh, okay. So, and then even yeah. there's terms for calf, cow, bull, young bull. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, our languages are very, very specific. Mm -hmm. And uh, are tied to our our stories and our history. Different people sometimes turning into animals, or animals turning into people. Right. Even snow. Oh yeah. There's a bunch of different words for snow. There's no specific word for snow because you have to talk about what the snow is doing, mm -hmm. or what kind of snow is it. Oh if yeah. If it's big flakes, small flakes. If it's blowing snow. If it. It's crusted snow. There are so many different words for snow. Fluffy or good yeah. for walking on. Yeah. It's it's like uh, I can't remember which movie it was. So uh, the Caucasian asked a Native American, uh, what, "What about the word horse?" And he says, "Well, we don't have a word for horse. We have words for what the horse is doing. Uh -huh. I can describe to you what it's doing, but I can't just tell you that that's a horse." Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It's the same with our language up here in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And the creation story is um, a long, I haven't ever heard the complete story, but that's something that they say it takes several days and it includes speaking of the raven. Are you familiar with the, the raven creation story? It seems like it's... But, yeah, I am familiar with the raven stories that we grew up listening to, but there's so many different stories. Like you said, it can take a while to tell the whole thing. Um, we had a, several storytellers in our community um, when I was growing up, but uh, I think I was too small to at attend the gatherings when the elders were telling the stories. There was Charlie Mountain, Charlie Brush. Uh, my grandfather was a very good storyteller also. Um, he wouldn't tell us the whole story all at one sitting. It takes too long. I think some of them might be documented in the Catherine Atla series. Is that the ones you're referring to? Uh, I was just referring to the, my conversations with the elders. Oh, okay. And mm -hmm. them wanting to have a series talking about mm -hmm. the creation story. I think Yukon Koikuk School District some years ago had a series called, um, it was had to do with the uh, stories of the raven anyways. Raven stories is what Stories we live by? Raven stories. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they talked about the different stories that the ravens brought. There's Like one... the creation of the world, I think, is okay. one of the stories. Um, how um, the raven would dive to the bottom of the ocean and bring up soil and create land. You know, it's, if you read the... Uh, or listen to the raven stories and you read the Bible, it's really, really super similar to how the world was created. Mm. So it's a very interesting mm -hmm. um, how the natives told their stories and then how um, the rest of the world, their spiritualities are very, very close. Mm. Um, that's all written down in the Bible. We didn't write it down. We just told stories, right? Yep. So. The Kedonsani. Mm -hmm. um, the village you come from, Ruby. Uh, Harold Smilka had a mural done based off of the raven stories and the Bible. And if you look at the mural in the background of the church, you'll see the raven in there. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. Yeah, I think it was John Van Zyl. John Van Zyl was hired to come him, yep. at the Catholic Church. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Um, it was actually done by requested by Harold Ismailka and painted by John Van Zyl and he donated it to the Ruby Church. Oh wow, it's a big art piece. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, the stories that I've heard listened to with the elders, they speak about 
that the creation of the land and the people were simultaneously, they were done together. So the idea of m migrating from other areas is not part of their story. Their story is that they were, that's why they have a connection with the land is because they were created with it. Mm -hmm. And so they've always been here in the land. <clears throat> so this might be a good chance to check in with our audience if you have any questions you want to ask our, our subject matter experts up here. And can you just make sure to repeat the question so it comes through online? So the question was from the audience was, in the lotto, did we collect duck eggs in the spring? And uh, the answer to the question is, yes, we did. What kinds? <laughs> as many could, as you could? Whatever we could find, yeah. And um, if you found them early enough and before they started forming, uh, then we were allowed to take them. But we could, couldn't take all of them. We could only take a certain number of them. So they would always check them. Um, and if there was something in there, then we would take them and um, force the bird to lay more eggs. And then we could go back and take a portion of those eggs. We caught some seagull eggs as well. Uh, and the other question was, do we do seagull eggs as well? Um, and the answer to that is yes, they did seagull eggs as well. There's a, a island down below Caltic that they call Egg Island. I was wondering about the olive-sided flycatcher. I missed some of what you said. I'm sorry? The olive-sided flycatcher. That was... Sorry. And, and the call, and it was... Um, one, one of you talked about what the call was predicting. The three-day message. It was... It was predicting the salmon were coming. Oh, the salmon, okay. So that when the olive-sided flycatcher sings his three-day, his song, three days. From your talks with the elders, have they mentioned the uh, olive-sided flycatcher today? Is it declining? They didn't really say that they haven't seen um, so, that for it... For example, it used to be a very common bird in Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. You'd be hard-pressed to find one, maybe one in five years or something. Overall, the songbirds they s s talk about within out in the rural communities, uh, Arctic Village. They talked about that they don't hear the songbirds anymore, and they're not, and that the songbirds are reducing. But basically, the songbirds aren't singing, so that's a concern that the elders have. Just in my experience and being out in the woods all the time. Um, when I was doing my job and growing up in the village, from the time I was a small boy till today, I've noticed that uh, we have a lot less songbirds. Mm -hmm. We have a lot less waterfowl. Um, I remember when we used to go over into the Cayu Flats when I was a, a child, and the, the ducks would take off and it would darken the sky. It would block the sunlight out. Underneath you, it, there would be a shadow wow. where they were flying. Wow. And that was that was just ducks that didn't, that's, you know, geese and swans were the same way. And slowly over time, you know, we would, we would release millions of waterfowl from Alaska to go down to the lower 48 in, in the fall. And every spring they would come back less and less and less over my lifetime. Last fall, I was really pleased to see um, the cranes flying south. And it's been years since I've seen that many flocks of cranes go by. When I was a kid, cranes used to fly by f for two weeks straight. There'd just be flock after flock mm. of cranes. So this time it was about three days, but the flocks weren't as large, but we were still getting a stream of cranes for about three days. So it's good to see that those are coming back. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an indicator that at least somewhere it's getting healthy. Yeah, Alaska is rich in nutrients, so the birds do well when they come to Alaska. And there's several birds that migrate up here that are having a problem because when they're going down to the lower 48, some of the farming fields, are they 
they do a sterile clean on some of those fields so there is no other food available for birds that normally go into those fields and eat and so there's it's impacting that some of the um, migratory birds are having not being able to return because they're not having that food source down there in the lower 48. And then just the popularity of um, waterfowl hunting in the lower 48 has blown up. I mean, it's, it's uh, really hugely popular down there. And all the land that's being developed, more of those apartment buildings, condos. Mm -hmm. We were just in Costa Rica and uh, we saw a sign, we, uh, we sell paradise. So here was this land, you know, that was undeveloped that was going to be turned into condos and birds were going to be out of luck. Is the audience feedback coming in, or should we repeat it? I would repeat specific questions. OK. Yeah. And then there was some sharing about land development and how in different areas, such as Costa Rica, that affects the animals. And it's not um, only just land development. It's also alternate energy sources, the development of wind turbines has really affected the song. Oh, population. they get sucked in there, huh? Well, just they built them at the right height so that when the birds are flying through, they're flying right through a gauntlet, basically, and getting destroyed by the wind turbines. Oh, wow. Um, That's an unintended consequence. I'm sure not many um, people are aware of. Right, because the wind areas are also the migratory routes for songbirds. Oh, because they need it to go on their journey, huh? Like the long Yep. I mean, long trips. just like winds make airplanes fly, winds help the birds fly. So uh -huh. they get to, um, I'll give you an example of how important wind is to uh, migratory birds. Up in the Kotzebue area, there's a place called the Cock River. Um, it's right where the um, Baldwin Peninsula meets the mainland, right there by, by um, so it's up there by Kotzebue. Yellow. Yep. Inlet there. Uh, right, right where it comes in towards the nor northern Seward Peninsula. Mm -hmm. The geese would gather there every fall, the geese and the swans, and, the, and they'd gather there by the thousands upon thousands. And they would just sit there. And as fall is getting later, they're, they're watching um, the weather. And as soon as the, you'll, every now and again, you'll see a bird take off and circle up, and it goes up and up and up, and after a while, it'll come back. And when the time is right, when the weather is right and the winds are right, mm -hmm. when the bird goes up and up and up and up and it doesn't come back, then the whole flock will go up and join it. I mean the whole flock. And they all take off at one time and you see them, just this big flock of birds circling up and up and up. And you can watch them. Wow. You can sit there and watch them. And pretty soon it's just a small, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and then bam, they're gone. They found the right current, I guess, huh? Yep, three days later they're sitting in California. Wow. So it's a pretty impressive sight to see. Another thing I heard that has affected maybe the smaller species is domestic cats. Like in talons like Fairbanks, they're predators by nature, right? And they like to go hunting, but maybe like they don't get a chance to uh, since they're domestic. So then they go find little birds and play with them and don't necessarily mm -hmm. eat them. But mm -hmm. do either of you? Uh, know anything about that issue? Um, the audience has shaken their head yes, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, where I'm from, we don't have very many cats. Uh, as pets? Uh, yeah, as, as pets. In the village. Um, we did have a cat of our own when I, uh, once I moved to Fairbanks. My daughter mm -hmm. had a cat, and um, it would climb around in the, in the willows hunting birds, so we declawed it and kind of stop that issue or at least slowed it down hmm. um, but we we made sure that we we kept a close eye on her when she was out in her hunting mode we let her take the voles and the mice and stuff from the ground but we wouldn't let her take the birds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well i'm interested in hearing what you have to say about it's, the cats it's approximately a billion birds a year in the united states are taken by cats oh did you say a billion I did. In the island of Maui, there are 500,000 feral cats. Wow. Whoa. 
500,000 feral, like wild cats. Like people didn't get their pets spayed or neutered, so they just went out and yeah, made more and more yeah, babies. Whatever. And, um, well, this affects it greatly. And we talked to some people when you know, we were there, and they said people don't want to do anything about it. Of course, some people do, but the majority of people, they love cats, and just let them be. But, and there's a big sanctuary on the island of Lanai. Do you remember? Was there 200,000, 100,000 cats, something like that? Mm -hmm. And they fund it with tourists. So say you go you know, to the island, and one of the activities you can do is visit the cat sanctuary. And of course, you pay for it, and you, know, you can buy merchandise. And, and hmm. they say that's helping keep them from being feral cats because they're feeding them. But it's still a small amount of what's in the islands, and there's practically no endemic birds left anymore in Hawaii. It is a migratory route for birds that come from Alaska going down right, to... the ones that are from Hawaii, mm -hmm. there's hardly any of them left. How many species, maybe? Three or four? It's a small number. Very small mm. number of endemic species. They've all been killed. So that was just making me wonder about the migratory birds, if they're going to be impacted well, because of stopping off at Hawaii. This is going to yeah. impact yeah, their population. And land development there, because, you know, if you've been there, you know it's a land of gondos, and so there's not a lot of open fields for them or forest, whatever their habitat is. Hmm. So. The, the other big one is tall buildings and lights. Oh, yeah. Windows, yeah. and we we suffer from that. You know, these little new. Usually, it's the newer, the younger birds. They're just learning to fly, and they see your window. And, and they said, even though they may fly away, most of them will have had enough internal damage that they won't make it. So, yeah. Hmm. Poor. Yeah, talking about birds hitting people's windows. My dad has stickers in his uh, office where he has big picture windows to try to help avoid work? that. It, I think it helps. Yeah. It's, it's not a, to me, it's not a good sign when a bird hits the window. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So in our culture, it is a bad sign when a bird hits a window. Yeah. It's a sign that they're bringing a bad message. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. I agree. In our culture, too. In our family's culture. Mm -hmm. So speaking more about migratory birds today, is there any sort of um, advice or best practices in terms of hunting or maybe advocating or in the realm of thinking about protecting this for our future? And we'll start here. So as a resource user, when you're out there, think about the number of um, birds you're, you're taking. Mm -hmm. um, only take what you need or what you can use. Um, I know that in this day and age of freezers and uh, food saver bags and stuff, people are tempted to take a little bit more. Um, just think about, think about the future and think about how many birds that you really need. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't take more than you need. Um, I know that today we have less hunters, so they tend to take a little bit more when they're out there, which is fine because they're sharing it. Yeah. with the community. So they're not really overall taking any more than the community needs, but uh, don't take any more than you need. Um, good also be a good um, steward of the environment. Uh, you know, don't go out there and destroy it or destroy the wetlands. Don't dump fuel or oil or anything like that in there. It's uh, very detrimental to the, the organisms and bugs and stuff that live there that the birds feed on, which in turn causes them to, you know, get sick and die. Don't use lead shot. Um, lead shot's horrible for the birds. Oh. Um, they'll ingest it and use it as grit to grind their food and give themselves lead poisoning. Um, that's another important one. Um, stick to the lead or the steel shot regulation um, and uh, just be a good resource user. Be responsible. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? He summed that up perfectly. I think, you know, everybody does their part in being able to protect the birds. And I think um, also it's interesting, um, the, um, the Alaska Migratory Bird 
Co-Management Council. They meet twice a year and they have been talking about the, this might be something different, but they've been talking about the avian flu um, that has been going through the lower 48 and has reached up here into Alaska. And they have um, information that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services on their website has updates on how to prepare uh, to be aware when you're hunting and to be aware of when you're handling uh, birds that are migrating from the lower 48 uh, up into Alaska because it has impacted. Uh, there's been a variety of different types of birds. Eagles have even been, you know, because predators are going to be involved with the, getting this uh, flu. And so that's been um, a big concern of uh, the different agencies that are uh, wanting to do conservation and help with migratory birds, but also thinking about that as well. Are you saying that it's good to look out for also because you don't want to eat the meat of a sick bird? Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you don't want, and even handling it could um, be questionable. So being able to look at the different signs of that they're not able to, uh, that they're, they're, they're falling over, that they're going places they shouldn't be going, that, that they actually have a you know, behavior where they're not looking like they're healthy. Okay. Are you familiar? Have you seen any? I have not seen any with avian flu. I mean, if they're flying in, they must be a healthy bird, right? Because most people are not going to be shooting birds that are laying on the ground or wobbling around or anything like that or doing anything outside of the ordinary. Most of the birds that uh, folks around home take or that even we take are ones that are uh, are flying in and, and appear to be healthy. There's no way for us to check them when they're flying in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're moving fairly quick and yeah. um, there's really no way for you to judge if this is a healthy or a sick bird. Mm -hmm. You can't really tell sometimes until you have them in the boat or... Yep. Or if they land and you can observe them, but where's the fun and where's the fair chase? Mm. And you're doing that, right? Well, we always try to keep our young people in mind. And so I wanted to make sure to include in our time today, if there's anything that you want our youth to really remember from this conversation. And as we were mentioning, you know, if you want to speak to a certain audience, you could look in the camera over there. So we'll take turns here. Can you tell us in a few words how youth or young adults can stay connected to their traditions through migratory birds or some things that they might be encouraged to learn or try? I'll start here. Well, if you're out in a village, um, you're probably already hunting and harvesting um, migratory birds with your family members. Um, it's like I said earlier to um, be good stewards and only harvest and take what you need. Mm -hmm. um, don't waste it. That's the worst thing you can do is waste your mm. your game once you harvest it. Make sure you take care of it properly and listen to your um, elders and your parents on how to properly care for your, your waterfowl. Um, you know, it's fairly warm during the spring days, you know. Uh, one of the tricks we used to use to keep our birds from souring was to pluck the, our grandmother would always make us pluck the stomach area and expose it so that it would stay cool. Okay. Um, so, you know, little tricks like that, just make sure that you take good care of the game that you take. I know in some cultures, the men will go out and bring back the food, and then the women are expected to do all the plucking. Is that how it was when you grew up? That's exactly how it was when I grew up. Um, it's changing a bit now. A lot of the guys that go out hunting now will um, take care of the birds while okay. they're out at uh, hunting camp. The problem with doing that is you're taking care of the birds when you're out at hunting camp. You're also taking you know, you're taking away the feathers that the ladies can use at home. Okay. Um, you're taking away some of the innards that they might want to use at home. So um, I, I think you're better off just bringing the whole thing home. A little bit of a trade-off. <laughs> there is a big, huge trade-off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, it's also a lot easier today to go down to the store and buy a pillow, right? Mm. <laughs> so. Or a feather bed. Those are super nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How about you, Deborah? Anything to add? Um, well, this is the purpose of this 
was to be able to create a, a poster that we could give to the school systems and, and take it out to the rural communities so that they're able to know what the migratory birds are and to be able to read and understand the different languages of the birds and the stories of the elders. So this was part of the reasoning why this poster was developed was to help the youth become aware. And then also part of that initiative is wanting to help the youth be able to get a mentor. So being able to not lose this traditional practice of, of, of understanding the whole subsistence of migratory birds and because they're concerned about that this knowledge is going away and that there needs to be some type of camp or workshop where, or opportunity for mentoring so that this knowledge doesn't get lost. Mm -hmm. So this was the beginning of that, it's creating this poster to be the beginning of those type of different initiatives. Well, thank you for your work on that. That's real important. Yeah, it looks yeah. like a great piece of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, is, it has also involved with several of the elders who have a language skill. Uh, Susan Pascavan is a major contributor to this work, and she brings that knowledge to be able to and, and then we have even ha brought it to the fish and wildlife so that they were looking at the scientific name and the migratory bird name. And so together with, between these two agencies and people and elders and Danakanaka was the main um, group that helped with this. So I'm not saying that you're a speaker, but with the people you work with, were the native names for the birds more descriptive? Scientific, yeah, absolutely. Sounds like this or looks like this or. You know. Yeah, it's more associated, as Daryl was explaining, that some of these words were more about um, describing what the bird's doing, and it's Can I not. See? Maybe I could find a couple of examples here. Oh, okay. So there's one. Um, with a white band on the side of its head. There's so many on here. <laughs> so the olive sided flycatcher, Cantopus cuperi, the they call it the three day bird, as was mentioned, Dachzi Nia. And the portion of the interview says, King Salmon is going to show up. So those birds, they don't go way back there. They'll be right on the river edge, probably a couple hundred feet back from the river. So that's where you normally hear them, next to the river. It whistle, three days, three days. But you got to understand that. A lot of people whistle like the bird like that. And you got to understand. So when you hear it, you wait till the third day, you put your fishnet in, and next day you catch a king. Same, same, same way with the fall chum. When the fall chum starts showing, it'll repeat that. And that, I believe this might be Benedict Jones mm -hmm. from Kayakut. And then where's that one? White crowned sparrow. Ketlen Tzachutana. So Ketlen is the, um, the shell, the dentalia, that has a lot of significance in our culture. And Sehut Anna sounds like a person to me. It says, according to Eliza Jones, they stated that in Kedantani times, the white crowned sparrow was a man who went on a long journey, probably a trading journey. He was coming home with Dentalia. On the trip home, he ran out of food, so he was starving. He put the Dentalia on his head before he died. They turned into three strips on its head. He turned into a little bird. He started flying home. When he got home, he sang this song. And that means in Danaka, Korikan Athabaskan, there is my home or camp now that it's too late. <laughs> so there's uh, all kinds of examples about different people associated with birds 
Quetzalcoatlna, the black cat chickadee, that's my mom's Danaka name. Um, they say they're, they're really robust little animals. They stay up here all, they're not migratory, right? They stay mm -hmm. and they have to harvest all these seeds to keep their body weight, but they're super tough. So um, also uh, Georgiana Linka, Lincoln has that name too, Quetzalcoatlna. So there's just a couple yeah, examples. Example they, um, they do generally describe something associated with our history. This is so cool. Well, um, we're coming up on the end of our time today, so we'll have one final chance to ask questions, and then we'll take a round, see if there's anything f in terms of final comments. Was there anything else you were curious about? Can I make a statement? Go ahead. So I'd like to end on something. You know, we talked about how bird populations are decreasing. And so on a positive side, like if the crane is starting to rebound, the same when DDT was in use in uh, our environment, the uh, eagle, the osprey, the peregrine falcon were all on the edge of this extinction. And today the osprey will fly up here, the eagle is increased, and the peregrine is all over the country. And so we need some positive examples too. Mm -hmm. the, for the audience, uh, they were just saying the uh, raptors or the large animal birds are are making a comeback so that's something positive we can we can note today so we'll start over here any final comments deborah thank you so much for your time today yeah i i agree ending on a positive note is being able to kind of respect these birds for what they do in the their lifespan of of traveling and going in and out of different areas but Alaska is rich in nutrients, and it is a, the nesting grounds for the migratory birds that come up into this area. And it is still the last place in the United States where the birds can get the nutrients that they do need. So we do provide, as the state of Alaska, as a great place for birds to migrate to because they do rebuild up their nutrients for their long journeys that they travel. So good on Alaska that we still have a land that is rich and abundant for migratory birds. Yep. There, anything you'd like to share at the close of our time today? Well, it's our continued conservation and being good stewards of the land. Um, it's like the audience said, we are starting to see some increases in some of our waterfall and it was like I observed last fall with the, the crane. Uh, it seems like those are starting to make a come back. So uh, if we continue to be good stewards, we'll continue to see increases. Namaste to you both. Really enjoyed our conversation and um, we'll see you all at our next topic. I'm not sure what we'll be doing next, but thank you again to our, our guests and our visitors. That's all we have for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.